since then. And she's going to tell you all about it right now. Please welcome Noel. I'm a little bit frazzled. I had like a whole like baby in a barn situation this evening. <laughs> so if you heard a baby crying, it's mine. <laughs> um, it was unplanned. Um, anyway, okay, so but I, I have my phone with my script, which is also unusual, but the babysitter might text me. Um, I didn't just abandon my baby in the deli. Um, so. <laughs> but I thought about it. <laughs> Uh, okay. <sighs> okay. So on December 20th, 2017, I realized I had had enough. I sat in a patient room at the El Rio Birth Center with my husband and I told a midwife I wanted this pregnancy to be over ASAP. Induce me tomorrow. Uh, let me back up. I made a couple of critical mistakes during my pregnancy. Uh, one of them was that when I told people, um, or when people asked, what I was having, I told them I didn't want to find out the sex until the birth, which was like jarring for a lot of people. They were like, but how do you plan? <laughs> the second mistake I made was telling people I do have a plan, a birth plan. Um, having a birth plan and telling people that is opening the door for them to tell you all the things that can and will go wrong during your birth and that planning is just asking for shit to go sideways and you shouldn't ever plan. The same people who cannot fucking believe that you aren't going to find out the sex of your baby because you need to plan what kind of baby you're going to have will shame you for planning what kind of birth you would like to have and frankly, neither of those things are any of their business. I think the problem that people have with birth plans, or rather the people who make them, is that they think that women who make birth plans have never had anything go wrong in their entire life. Like, they thought that my birth plan was this like Pinterest vision board. <laughs> with like essential oils infusing and Sarah Bareilles playing live. And the actual delivery happening in like warrior two position. <laughs> And like, if it doesn't go exactly like that, I'd lose my shit. And if, honestly, if I had taken this approach for any other part of my life, I wouldn't have graduated college or started storytelling or conned a doctor into marrying and impregnating me. Because all of that shit takes careful planning and goal setting. Really. It's a long con. My plan was to have as little intervention as possible. I didn't want medicated pain management. I didn't want to be induced. I didn't even want to have my baby in a hospital. I got all my prenatal care at the El Rio Birth Center where I planned to give birth after laboring at my house for as long as possible. Um, and uh, along with my the strategies I learned in a 12-week class on unmedicated childbirth, I planned to cope with strong contractions by picturing the bear attack in The Revenant <laughs> with Leo, and just like reminding myself, at least you're not being mauled by a bear in the dirt. You've got your essential oils. It's better, it's beautiful. Anyway, so that was the plan. I, I, I've done a lot of endurance athletics with my husband. Like we've done like, we've scaled mountains and ridden our bikes really far, too far. <laughs> We've like run marathons and half marathons and I've done all of that while whining and crying the whole time. It's called type two fun because it's not fun while you're doing it. It's fun to say that you've done it after the fact. And unmedicated childbirth was my opportunity to have type 2 fun where no one could give me shit about whining and crying the whole time. Because that's what you're supposed to do. As Hollywood tells us. So, um, okay, so that was the plan. The first thing that went wrong with that plan started in my third, the beginning of my third trimester. I found out that my baby was breech. Um, having a breech pregnancy, um, which by the way, 
those of you who don't know, it means your kid hasn't flipped from the, like, the cannonball to the nosedive position. <laughs> face towards the exit. Uh, having, a breach to having a breach pregnancy automatically disqualified me from giving birth at the birth center because midwives don't have the training to safely deliver a baby coming out butt first. Uh, most obstetricians actually don't even have that training. Uh, most of them will try to manually flip your kid over like from the outside of your stomach. That only works about a third of the time in first time full term pregnancies. Um, and if it doesn't work, um, they'll schedule a C-section. A C-section was not in my plan. And so the midwives at El Rio tried to be helpful um, and tell me ways to get my baby to flip naturally. Like one lady was like, there's a thing called spinning babies where you can like do headstands and hang backwards off your couch to try to coax the baby to flip over. Another nurse told me about homeopathic remedies you can buy at Sprouts that like, inspire the baby to flip. And she showed me, she had some homeopathic remedies on her at the time, and she took one for happiness, and it looked like a little bit like a Tic Tac. And when she ate it, she goes, it tastes kind of minty. And I was like, oh my God, she wants, to believe, wants me to believe that a breath mint is going to help flip my baby over. This is a medical professional. So finally a doctor at El Rio told me that there is one OB in Tucson who will attempt to deliver your baby through the baby chute. <laughs> Breach. And I didn't even know that was like an option. Um, so I YouTubed Breach Vaginal Delivery. <laughs> And let me tell you, were it not for the seriousness of the situation, it would be hilarious. <laughs> because my kid was in what's called the frank breech position, which means the butt was down and the head and the feet were at the top of my abdomen. And so, like, the butt would come out first and look like a ballpark frank backing out of my vagina. And the whole thing is just absurd. <laughs> The breech baby doc works at my the hospital where my husband practices, and so he actually reached out and for a consult. She had an appointment with us. She took a look at the baby on the ultrasound, and she was like, "Well, I think I can flip this thing." Um, I think she was kind of into type two fun too. To be <laughs> so the day before Thanksgiving, against the odds, we had a successful external cephalic version. It's where you, it's that manual manipulation. It's like a massage on your front side where no one is having any fun. <laughs> it's pretty unpleasant. It's pretty, it's, I, I'd go so far as to say it's painful. Um, a lot of women opt to have a spinal block while they're having it done, but I already knew I wanted to have like birth without medicated pain management, so I opted not to do it. But we, it was successful, and we were back on track to have a birth center unmedicated, uh, uninduced delivery. And it was full term at this point. We were at 37 weeks, so it was like time to get started making that happen. And so I, I walked around a lot. I like summited Tumamok a lot <laughs> during that time. If you were like on Tumamok in December of 2017 and saw like this nine month pregnant walrus woman <laughs> ascending like she was conquering Everest, that was me. Uh, my due date came and went, and I started doing that trek daily. And I'd also take these long walks around Tucson, like miles, because I was on maternity leave, and so like there's nothing to do but like make this happen. So I was like walking for miles around Tucson, and I would like stop into restaurants and be like, "Give me something spicy," and then like keep going. I like made myself nest, and, uh, thinking that that would make labor start. I don't think I got the concept clear, but like that didn't happen. I just organized stuff that didn't need organizing, and I didn't want to organize. Nothing. So okay, fast forward back to December 20th, 2017. I was nine days past my due date, and I was like, all right, dudes, this is enough. I told the midwife, let's nix that do not induce part of my plan. Let's get this thing going tomorrow at El Rio. I mean, I'm sorry, at Tucson Medical Center. I had officially been disqualified once again from giving birth at El Rio because I was past 41 weeks. And so, all right, cool, we're gonna go to we're gonna go to Tucson Medical Center, but I'll still have my midwives, it's cool. The induction was scheduled for Thursday, December 21st. 
Uh, and so I was pretty excited. I was gonna have a solstice baby. Um, I went to bed Wednesday night thinking, I'm excited to meet my baby. I'm sad that labor didn't start on its own, but you know, it's, it's gonna be a good thing. We're gonna have a baby tomorrow. I woke up the next day and to a phone call at 5 a.m. from TMC Labor and Delivery, and they were like, we're full, you can't come in. Oh. Yeah, they can do that to you. <laughs> And so they're like, you're, we're full, like there's no rooms, we'll call you later in the morning if something opens up. And I was like, oh my God, I'm flying standby, I'm having a baby. <laughs> I was so frustrated because like, I was really excited to meet this baby and I was angry that my labor didn't start on my own. And I was angrier at this cruel reminder that my labor didn't start on my own because these other women with their functioning reproductive systems, with spontaneous labors, were disrupting my planned chemically induced labor and it was all just very unjust to me. And so that whole day we were kind of moping around and the breech baby doc reached out to my husband and was like, do you have your baby yet? It's like time. And, uh, and he was like, no, here's what's going on. And she was like, well, I can induce you right now at UMC. And so we, you know, after my, my husband and I had carefully planned this midwife-assisted birth center birth, we sat in our living room at 11 o'clock at night and weighed the pros and the cons of sticking with the El Rio midwives at TMC and giving birth sometime, maybe, um, and switching to the breech baby dock and going tonight. And so we packed up the car and we went to UMC and we started the induction at midnight. So I started this induction at midnight I started Pitocin at 9 a.m., which if no one, if you don't know what Pitocin is, it's just like synthetic oxytocin. It makes your uterus contract. It's uh, painful. Um, and um, 15 hours after we started Pitocin, a whole 24 hours after we started labor, I got an epidural. I'm hoping at least one person in this room thought I was going to say, I had a baby. <laughs> no. <laughs> Even after after 15 hours unmedicated on synthetic oxytocin, Pitocin, um, I wasn't even close to having a kid. Um, my labor was complicated by the fact that it was so late in the game. Um, my, so here's how labor works. Your baby has to come out through a 10 centimeter uh, cervix. And so in order for a cervix to like dilate from zero to 10 centimeters, your uterus contracts and this is labor. Uh, what was happening though was every time my uterus contracted hard enough to actually make some progress and dilate my cervix, the uh, old past its due date placenta stopped working and would like stop transferring oxygen to my kid and then the kid's heart rate would drop for extended periods and it was just this constant like turn up the Pitocin, turn down the Pitocin, turn up the Pitocin, turn down the Pitocin. And so like, uh, because to, and I had wore an oxygen mask on my face that whole second day and it was like really scary. The, um, the staff kind of alternated between telling me that they thought I might be progressing to telling me that they thought I was gonna need a C-section. And remember, a C-section was not in my plan. And so the nurses would like, tell me in the most condescending tone possible that the most important thing to remember is that I would get a baby at the end of this. <laughs> if you've ever told a pregnant woman that, stop it. <laughs> I know it's supposed to be helpful. I know it's like they've got goodness in their heart or whatever, but like, I'm not a fucking idiot. I know I'm gonna get a baby at the end of this. I've been growing the thing for nine months. <laughs> very aware and excited that I'm going to meet my kids soon, but telling a woman that she, the only thing that should matter is that she's going to get a baby at the end of this and that she shouldn't have any preferences about her abdomen not being sliced open is like not just misogynistic and patronizing, it's also tantamount to psychological torture because I'm about to be a mommy and, and I'm questioning if I'm going to be a bad one because I'm pretty concerned about, you know, the scar. Uh, but also just like <laughs> having, having uh, surgery, major surgery in my abdomen. And so it's not cool. Cut it out. So anyway, ah, that was a digression. It actually was scripted, but it got kind of intense. Um, so anyway, um, so things were looking not that hopeful. Another attending physician had taken over the, um, the induction on the second day. The breech baby doc had gone home and this one was pushing pretty hard for surgery. Um, 
Uh, somewhere midway in the afternoon that second day, a nurse took my temperature and found out that I had a fever, and so she uh, charted that I had an infection, and that the baby had an infection, and that everyone was going to need a C-section. Um, and I was just like insisting that this, this isn't the case. I think I can do this. And my husband was just like, okay, but she has a fever, sure, but like she's also been like laboring for 40 hours at this point. And it's like, she's getting hot. Like, <laughs> it like, does it have to be that she has an infection? Are there other symptoms we should be looking for? Turns out there were. A resident actually was kind of clocking those because she was like, I don't, you guys, I don't think she doesn't have an infection. So it was like a hot debate, right? Anyway, um, but it was looking, it was not looking pretty, very good. I was pretty sure I was going to have surgery the next day. Um, I, um, I got kind of spiritual. Um, I've always been pretty spiritual, but never like a real evangelizer. But that day I made like everyone pray with me. I was reaching out to people over Facebook, like pray for this birth. Even if they're not religious, I was like, I don't care. I made my husband pray with me. They say that there's no atheists in a foxhole or like agnostics or cultural Jews for that matter. But like, <laughs> but I think that's because the person whose foxhole is slowly dilating is demanding that everyone get on the same page about God and pray. And so, Everyone's praying for me. I went to sleep at like 8 o'clock. I was thinking, well, I'm definitely going to have surgery the next day. Um, it's not looking good. I woke up later that evening and the breech baby doc was back. And I was like, what are you doing here? Someone had called her back in. Um, I don't know if it was like the attending on call who was just sick of my like granola birth plan, don't cut me open attitude. Or if it was like the resident who was like clearly in my corner like advocating for me. Or, or she just really felt strongly that she should be there to deliver this kid surgically or whatever. Um, she's back, she's checking, and she's like, ah, oh, you've progressed a little bit, but let's just check you back in like an hour and see what's going on. So like, I tried to not get hopeful. She comes back in an hour, and she's like, you're at eight centimeters. Remember, the, the magic number is 10, so I'm getting there. She's like, it's probably good enough. <laughs> And she just had me push. She had me do one push, and she checked, and she's like, yep, this is good enough. Wake up your husband. <laughs> so I pushed, I pushed for like, like 45 minutes or something, and then she's like, hold up. We need to get a pediatrician in here. It's like time. So like they stopped me. To get a pediatrician team, like a whole crew of people, like file into my room. They're like, um, okay, on the next one, you're gonna reach down and grab the baby under the arms and pull it up on you. And I was like, what if I drop the baby? <laughs> Which I think is something that everybody asks themselves immediately before they become the primary caregiver of a baby. Like, I guarantee my babysitter's thinking that right now. All right, she's like, you're not gonna drop the baby, just push. Okay, so I like reached down and I did it. I like, grabbed the baby and pulled it up on me. I delivered my kid. <laughs> I have to tell you, I've been waiting six and a half months to hear applause for that. <laughs> Jesus. No one congratulated me in the moment. It was really hard. It was really hard. Thank you. All right, so I pulled the baby up on me. I tried to breastfeed her a little bit, but since she had an infection, they took me, took her away like pretty much immediately to stick her with an IV and pump her full of antibiotics. And um, I was so focused on that kid, I didn't realize I had just like a little bit of, I was hemorrhaging, hemorrhaging. Uh, it was like spurting blood out. Um, I, this is so graphic, I'm so sorry. But you know what, you should hear this. <laughs> Thank you for the applause. Um, I had that standard tear that everyone gets in the vagina, but that wasn't where the <laughs> that wasn't where the blood was coming from. Uh, as it turns out, those extra two centimeters were pretty important. Um, my kid plowed through my partially dilated cervix and lacerated it. You had to hear that. This is like that's my feather in my cap. Like <laughs> for weeks, I told people I have stitches in my cervix. Like if anyone gave me shit about anything. You know what? I'm sick. Anyway, I'm sorry. <laughs> All right, so like, let's fast forward. Christmas Day, the next day, my, my 
OB is in my room saying, like, I'm sorry that, like, so much went wrong and the only thing you really got to keep was that you died. Yeah, I guess that was the only part of my plan I got to keep, but I'm so glad I didn't take the approach of don't have a plan because it'll all go wrong because so much more could have gone out of my control. Like if I hadn't been educated and my husband and I hadn't been able to like intelligently advocate for ourselves. To us, that was what having a plan was all about, was having autonomy and having the ability to tell, to communicate what we wanted and what I wanted about my body. Um, on, on December 24th, 2017, I beat some pretty incredible odds because of those that plan. And my kid was among 3% of kids, of babies that, oh, I forgot to tell you, we had a daughter. Um, <laughs> she's in the deli. <laughs> my kid was among the 3% of babies that don't turn head down on their own um, by full term. Uh, she was among the like 10% that don't come out on their own by 41 weeks. She was, I was among the one in four women whose induction took longer than 24 hours. It was 48 hours. Um, and I'm among 0.2% of women who had a cervical laceration during childbirth. But um, but I'm so glad I like I had a plan and um, you know on, on December 24th 2017 I had had enough of pregnancy I had had enough of how women, people treat women in pregnancy in this society um, whether you're interested in a type two fun adventure or uh, an elective C-section or a scheduled induction or any variety of labor and delivery like women deserve to be treated as autonomous intellectual like sentient beings <laughs> um and who, who have some say over what happens to their body um yeah you know, a, a wise man named andre 3000 once said you can plan a pretty picnic but you can't predict the weather and, and they, that's true there are a lot of unknowns in life and maybe you can avoid those that disappointment by not planning pretty picnics or maybe you can bring a fucking raincoat thank you yeah.